In this video we're going to be taking a look at H.G. Wells, not really as the fictional um, writer, but more of a historical revisionist. And we'll see from some of his early uh, works how that played out. First with a quote, thinking clearly and effectively does not come by nature. Hunting the truth is an art. We blunder naturally into a thousand misleading generalizations and false processes. Yet there is hardly any intelligent mental training done in the schools of the world today. We have to learn this art if we are to practice it at all. all right, a little hat tip. We always get hat tips from these characters. And I think we're given one right there. So it starts with uh, humble upbringings. This would be uh, in London, Bromley, London, where he grew up. And we have another quote, after people have repeated a phrase a great number of times, they begin to realize it has meaning and may even be true. I'm reminding me of another quote from another gentleman with a mustache from our historical narrative. Interesting correlation, I thought. And nevertheless, we get humble beginnings, not much going on in his early years, uh, manual labor. As we can see here, the son of a domestic servant, inadequate education as usual with these characters, um, works in menial jobs, eventually gets into Midhurst Grammar School and is taught by none other than Darwin's bulldog, Thomas H. Huxley. And gets into the Royal College of Science, there we have Huxley with the famous pose, in case there was any question as to his motivations. Yet again, the same gentleman a little later in life. Uh, very telling, I think. I think there's a lot of symbolism, go symbolism going on with these uh, old photographs. Trying to tell us something without telling us something. And Wells, a member of the Fabian Society, this would be the uh, logo, basically a sheep or wolf in sheep cloth sheep's clothing. So under the guise of benevolence and the furtherment of society, um, they're working toward an end goal of, of uh, what they think the world should look like. Here we have George Bernard Shaw, beware of false knowledge. It is more dangerous than ignorance, another member of the Fabian Society. And uh, no truer words are spoken as it relates to our history. And we have here again H.G. Wells with some of these famous historical figures, recognizable. Churchill apparently was a uh, admirer of Wells's work. Oh, he was quoted to say, I owe him a great debt. Very interesting. Wells also having interviewed the gentleman here on the right, as well as other historical figures, such as the gentleman here on the left. So Lenin, Stalin, we know the political leanings of these gentlemen. So Wells really aligned with these uh, individuals um, with his allegiance to the Fabian Society. Even there with this is Ivan Pavlov, the gentleman who talked about how we can train people, behaviorist, and just some statues you'll find in modern day uh, England as an homage to H.G. Wells. So let's get into his writings. First we'll look briefly at Pavlov. Now, before we move ahead, I want to quickly go over um, Pavlov, who was acquainted with H.G. Wells. What he's known for, uh, classical conditioning being um, um, his discovery. Uh, and if we can put this into context of um, Wells as a fictional writer, I think there's a, there's a bit of a correlation there. Also, I'd like to point out that H.G. Uh, Wells really became the novelist 
um, who took over for Charles Dickens, um, the popular novelist of the time, I would say. Here's Dickens here, showing you all he's got. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the, the works of H.G. Wells, especially the, uh, the most well-known works. He definitely comes out of the gates flying. Uh, we have, uh, well, the textbook of biology, which I found. Just a little blurb on it. This is supposedly his first writing. Um, interesting here, we have the, uh, the sketch of him being dissected by the animal, the, the rabbit, I suppose. But there's some symbology there, I would suggest. But as far as novels go, he comes out of the gates with the time machine. Um, so right away he is um, getting into the whole idea of, uh, of humanity branching off into two separate species. So we have the Morlocks and the Eloys in that. This definitely, uh, I mean, this has been sort of done to death um, movie-wise. and It's not hard to find this one, but uh, interesting um, to start out with for sure. Um, and he also gets into um, sort of along the same lines, he gets into the island of Dr. Moreau where we get into the genetic manipulation, modification, manipulation, and all the rest of it. Um, let's roll through uh, a, a few more of uh, his titles so we get a sense of, uh, of his angle. Now I want you to remember this one in the day of the comet. Um, this will come up a little later in the video. I'll try to tie it in with, uh, with something else. We have the moon narrative, the space narrative, being uh, implanted, conditioned into the minds of the public. And the sleeper wakes. A lot of uh, a lot of visuals too from his early writings having to do with uh, airships. Let's go through some of these here. We have the alien invasion narrative creeping up as well. Here's one of the tales of space and time. Of course, you get the War of the Worlds. Um, very well known. Um, where Mars attacks, basically. Um, but it's basically a, uh, a takeover of Earth, which I will propose in this video that uh, the works of H.G. Wells, in my opinion, were to cover up a takeover of the Earth. Here we have also a soldier type character uh, and H.G. Wells basically calling that the obliterated man. So what's going, what's really going on here? With, is he, is he telling us a bit of history, um, but uh, disguising it in fiction? Here we have some parallels with the uh, Noah's flood, the great flood. And then, of course, he gets into, and this goes back to what Churchill had mentioned about him. Um, he was actually hired as a propagandist in the World War I um, timeline. And he's also had a hand in the creation of the League of Nations, which turns into the uh, United Nations. And uh, if you're familiar with how that stepping stone approach uh, works, then you know the end goal. And you'll see in a later version of his writings. Um, the title for the end goal of all of that. He also um, did some outlining of history, so he's involved with implanting a historical timeline of the Earth and of mankind. He did two different versions. So he is giving people again, conditioning people to accept that Darwinian timeline, because we know he was trained under Huxley. And then while in the same vein he is uh, scripting a future, I would suggest. And here, one of his later writings, and this is what I was getting at. I will read it out for you. Um, but he definitely lays out um, future plans, gets into a whole utopian ideas, and it all ties in with his Fabian socialist um, um, affiliation. H. G. Well, the war in the the war in the air. I find this one very interesting. I'll be bringing this up a bit throughout the video, um, where he basically outlines um, the aerial assaults of World War I, to the point where if you research this, it's difficult to tell if we're looking at uh, his depictions or if we're looking at actual uh, news reports from World War 
um, one. And like I said, do recall that he was a, hired on as a propagandist. So then that begs the question, um, how much of what we know about World War I in that time frame uh, is fiction or modified fact muddled with fiction? So this is something to think about, to consider. I just have a couple depictions here. You have a sort of a London on fire. That'll come up later in the video as well. Some of these are just uh, depictions from early depictions from some of his writings. From the, the war in the air, we have here you have sort of the tram idea, and we have them in the air, a bit of an Eiffel Tower going on, steamship narrative. Okay, so well, if we're thinking of uh, the war for the world rather than the war of the worlds, um, and then we tie that in with the old world and new world narrative the creation of the new world narrative um, could it be that H.G. Wells is basically fictionalizing the depiction of the takedown of the old world which included what we know of as steamships and uh, um, dirigibles you might say airships things like that and then of course the changing of technology because it's right around that same time where we move uh, from steam um, into the uh, automobile and gas powered everything so that's kind of what I'll be suggesting in this and we'll be getting into uh, 1800s and what actually happened in the 1800s uh, specifically focusing on North America just because there's so much to look at now what I'd like to do for you is attempt to paint a picture of what I propose is potentially um, the cleanup operation of a war for the world that we live in today. So we're starting with some depictions here of the American Civil War, or American War of Independence, and then we get to the uh, French uh, Revolution. We have a depiction here, uh, and then our timeline sort of takes us to about 1811 with what, what is known as Tecumseh's Comet. And here we have Tecumseh, Shawnee warrior, show respect to all people, but groveled to none. Yeah, I can add a lot. I wasn't only known as Tecumseh's Comet. Uh, it has also been referred to as Napoleon's Comet. Let's take a closer look at uh, this uh, phenomenon because it would be getting into what we know of as the... Um, of the New Madrid earthquakes. So I found an interesting um, website for you, smokymirror.com. Um, kind of gets into some of the strange events surrounding the New Madrid earthquakes of 1812, 1811, 1812. Um, you can definitely uh, check it out, link will be in the description. Uh, the, do mention Tecumseh's Comet, um, predating the uh, earthquakes. And I say earthquakes because we're looking at a series apparently of earthquakes over a several month period. The comet was visible for 11 months, they say, during the earthquakes, accompanied by a solar eclipse. So lots of uh, phenomena going on in the skies. I'll just skip quickly to some of the strange things that have been recorded from that time. And of course all of this is as much as we can trust anything from the past, so we take it all with a grain. Uh, but uh, interesting, have a lot of reports, flashes, glows, and fires in the sky recording dur recorded during the earthquakes. Um, years before the earthquake struck, tales of weird lights moving through forests and hills began to emerge. Lightning and sparks were said to crackle across the ground, according to some accounts. So uh, what are we looking at here? Is this is this really natural phenomenon, or you know, as we tie this into uh, to H.G. Wells's work, you know, War of the Worlds idea? Um, maybe we're looking at uh, something else. And curiously enough, we have right at the same time the War of 1812 going on in North America. So, I mean, are we looking at? Um, fabrications, cover stories for what may have actually been going on. Uh, I think it's a possibility. 
That's just a suggestion of mine. We get all these depictions of devastation. Here's the taking of the city of Washington. And now we get into us, uh, all sorts of pictures. And I will be jumping around quite a bit over that century, uh, the 1800s. We have places like Charleston uh, showing the devastation of what we're told is uh, the American Civil War. St. John, New Brunswick, um, Great Fire. And as we go through these, uh, uh, I have mentioned in a lot of my videos, um, are we looking at the uh, remains of a fire? Or is there much more going on here than uh, we maybe would like to admit? And are these just cover stories for some sort of devastation? some sort of war for the world. I don't know of any fire that can do this to buildings. We have, this is Toronto, 1904, they give this. And I have an issue with the dates too. It's all very sort of, what can you trust? It's basically um, where I'm getting at. This all kind of looks like it's the same type of devastation. Um, here we have Seattle, 1889. We have the San Francisco earthquake, 1906. We're having the same look of these buildings that look like they've just sort of ripped to shreds. And then we have, of course, the Indian Wars in the States. And then this can tie right into the uh, World's Fairs and the uh, creation of the new narrative. Um, and are we looking at a, basically a cleanup operation of the remnants of a past civilization. Uh, this is showing you a lot of uh, what we might call meltage going on here of what looks to be an old red brick building. So is, are a lot of these uh, photographs and, and a lot of the narrative and of course these narratives would be popping up in the schools that were just being created um, or we're looking at a resetting of history. And a claiming of what was once a magnificent civilization um, now basically uh, having been devastated and you have these uh, companies such as the uh, Dutch East in India Company, the Hudson's Bay Company, the British Crown, the Vatican, all these uh, nefarious uh, organizations. You have them resetting the realm and implanting a a historical narrative that favors them and they're doing this through the hidden hands of the organizations that we come across so often as we dig up history here we have world war one yes i'm tying this all in with the events of the early 1900s as well i think that it's all part of the same uh reset basically The Great Boston Fire. Absolutely devastating. Could very well be Dresden, World War II. The devastation is not much different. So, are we looking at some sort of weapon? Some types of weapons that uh, have been basically scrubbed from our history books and fictionalized? Dayton, Ohio, Charleston, Civil War, Chicago now. Great. This has been uh, covered extensively in a, on several of the channels that do this type of work. Um, Chicago is definitely uh, reset, I would say. And it's, it's kind of interesting, too, because you go through, you know, the, the pictures of the buildings that still stand in places like Chicago, and there's so much amazing... Uh, buildings that survived makes you wonder what was destroyed and what we're actually looking at in some of these there's, there's the honest Abe himself and his uh, compadre with a cold hand or cold hands so at the very least we need to question historical narrative I used to use the word narrative okay narrative is a story right it's a storyline Okay, and my proposal is we have been implanted a storyline. This is for Columbia, Virginia, Civil War. We have been implanted with with a uh, historical 
narrative. This is a story, and like we're in this video, we are covering a story writer, H.G. Wells, who I propose was uh, using fiction to cover the tracks of this reclaiming of the realm um, for these nefarious uh, inheritors, let's say, controllers, with the end goal being, well, where we are today. They're trying to wrap up their operation. So I have decided to uh, try to uncover some of their uh, some of the fiction and then maybe um, we can ponder on what might be fact. Dayton, Ohio. They're calling this the, the remnants of a flood. What kind of flood does this make any sense to you? Dresden, of course. This is a horrific story. Dresden, World War II, bombed into oblivion. The city of art. And as I, I look through a lot of these photographs, it makes me wonder uh, what type of weapons were being used even in uh, the world wars that we know of. How much of that has been uh, fictionalized. Here's Ireland, 1916. What types of bombs, what type of devastation? And leave some of these walls standing and the rest of them. Blown to smithereens. This is New York going way back. And of course I had to throw this in there. This is uh we're on a repeat of this obviously and uh I could try to pull the same crap over and over, I I suggest, and uh I don't think it's gonna work this time. We got too much, too much on ya. Yazoo, Mississippi. Franco Prussian War. Right. Uh, a lot of people have suggested a lot of these old photographs look posed. I mean, we do pose for photographs, but there's something, something dishonest about the depictions of the past, I would suggest. And I'm going to play for you now um, a video of uh, what actually went on during uh, the World's Fairs. Uh, I do suggest the World's Fairs were instrumental in resetting the narrative. Short answer. <clears throat> Short answer. Yeah. Every city in North America had a giant fire in the 1800s. Right? It doesn't matter. You look at yeah. Boston, Baltimore. Uh, Chicago, Toronto, Seattle, Portland, it doesn't matter. Every single city has this massive fire that burns down most of the city, supposedly because they're all built of wood buildings, but when you look at the photographs, it's all just charred <laughs> and destroyed stone. Yeah. Yeah. And and not only stone, these, these cities look like Dresden in 1944, right? Like the first thing my building contractor friend said when I showed him some pictures of the Boston fires, like, well, who bombed this city, you know? Um, so you've got this world, this this is massive, fires that they claim take over the course of 50 or 60 of course the cities go through magic rebuilds right there seattle rebuilt itself in i don't know six weeks or something right um but you have all these fires and the question becomes well what if the fires didn't take place over 100 years like they say or 50 years what if all the fires took place over the course of a year or two now what are you now what are you talking about just coincidental city fires or some type of gigantic you know almost like Lindsay. interplanetary interplanetary war. So my feeling is what we know of as the Civil War is a tiny little speck, a tiny piece of this much gianter conflict that's going on in that time frame or is related to whatever that's related to. And and maybe the Civil War is the end of it. The Civil War is the, it, it's the mop-up operation. The ones who had uh, they hadn't killed everybody off yet, and they had gotten out of the cities, but they were still living in certain areas uh, okay and fine. And so this was the last reconnaissance uh, missions, you might say, to, to finish that. Here, yeah, here's some this fires. This So interesting. That's Howdy McCoskey on a Tinfoil Hat podcast with uh, Sam Tripoli and friends. Uh, I'll put the link in the description. 
Uh, Howdy's got some really good insight on uh, what went on, uh, especially with the World's Fair as a resetting of the narrative. Michelle Gibson also gets into um, a, the Crystal Palace being the reset um, kickoff for the new narrative. So I definitely think it's worth uh, it's worth diving into. I think there's some merit to this, and I think this is all actually fairly new uh, research. Which, of course, when anything is new, people um, want to do their best to shrug it off because it just doesn't have, doesn't have enough time behind it, enough study behind it. But uh, um, people have to break ground. So a lot of these people, Howdy McCoskey, Michelle Gibson, John Levi's are groundbreakers, right? Martin Lee K. Uh, Flat Earth British, groundbreakers. Uh, Campbell at Autodidactic. So my hat's off to, the, to uh, these individuals. Uh, and I definitely encourage you out there if this resonates with you, this research um, um, pick up the torch I encourage you to pick up the torch and uh, find your niche and, and just get the visuals out there get the ideas out there, don't be afraid to be wrong I do have one more snippet I would like to share with you from this conversation it's not very nice um, but I think it does put it uh, quite concisely as to uh what they were trying to achieve with these world's fairs and um, the resetting of the narrative. I will say, yeah, good question. I, if I had to make this uh, speculation, I think there were that things were started in the 16, what we know as the 16, 1700s, and of course the, the whole time thing is it's hard to figure out anyway. But in well, that's when I think the first rewritings of things were, were slowly started, but the main element of it happened. Uh, between 1850 and 1900. So in this time when the World Fairs were going on that I wrote about in my book, what I realized one of the big things that these fairs were doing were giant historical theme parks. I mean, like literally you were talking about Disneyland on steroids for the his for the history areas. And I think they were they were presenting a brand new narrative. And what a when you have no television and you have no movies and you have no radio, the best way to present a narrative into people's minds is to have these giant fairs, send them all over the world, tell the same story, the same message about whether it's ancient Rome, whether it's dinosaurs, whether it's about what happened in the Middle Ages, what happened at the Battle of Waterloo, like whatever. And you just say over and over and over again. And of course, the people coming to these fairs are richer people. They're, the poor couldn't come to these fairs. So it's all your school teachers are going to go, your university professors are going to go, the people who have higher ed, higher educated jobs are going to go. So they're just going to say, hey, I just went to the World's Fair and I, I got to see gladiators fight in the Col Colosseum and I got to see what happened in ancient Rome. Well, you got to trust them. It was the World's Fair. World's Fair has got to know what's going on. And the person has just experienced it. They haven't read it in a book. They experienced it. You know, the, the World's Fair in San Fran in St. Louis, we can go into real detail how crazy these fairs were, but I'll give you an example. They had 22 historical exhibits at the fair. Each one needed approximately two to 3,000 actors, two to 3,000 actors in order to think of the scale we're talking here. So the streets of Jerusalem were one exhibit. 22 streets of Jerusalem, 22 were recreated. They recreated the Holy Sepulchre, they, 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 the, the manger where Jesus is supposed to be born. They've got this, they've got that. And they brought over 3,000 people from Israel to, or I guess it wasn't Israel then, right? From Jerusalem at the time to be actors in the cafes, in the restaurants, in the whatever. And, and this was continuous. They had the Siberian Railroad. You would get on a railway car and they would, of course, shake the railway car and then they'd move the scenery behind you. And then the 2000 actors would change clothes. You'd open the doors and you'd be at one stop somewhere on some city on the Siberian Railroad. And you'd do whatever you do there to get back on the car. The car would shake, the scenery would go again. The actors would change the clothes and you'd be in another city and another city and another city. And apparently this was so well done. You would almost think you really did just take a trip on the Siberian Railroad. And this, so you've got ancient Rome, you've got Jerusalem, you've got the Siberian Railroad, you've got the uh, German Alps, you've got France in the Middle Ages, you've got Spain in the time of something else, you've got uh, the Italian Renaissance, you've got, you've got all of this stuff. What a perfect way to present a historical narrative to the world's population. Sounds just like that's exactly That's exactly when it happened. <laughs> wow, so. Yeah, wow. That's like Disneyland. If you go to Disneyland, there's a Bugs Life, there's cars, there's Star Wars, and they're all different little, you know, 
fucking little different world. That's exactly what that is. And everyone's dressed up in their own little fucking outfit. Yep. So imagine that as a historical narrative. So you've got two things going on with these fairs. So I'll explain what the fairs were in a second, but you've got one of the big parts of the historical exhibit. Then you've got the human zoo. The human zoos were really important where they wanted to make, where they brought primitives from all over the world and you could go see Zulus and various native Indian tribes and you could see aboriginals from Australia and and primitives from from the Philippines and they wanted to make sure they were shown as as savage and primitive as possible. At the Buffalo Fair, they forced the the native Indians to go in the Coliseum and kill 700 dogs and then eat them in front of like 10,000 people because of course you need to show that these Indians are primitive and oh my you as a, God. As a great white as the great white uh, Victorian are of course uh, are above these poor and they they would do okay I'll cut it off there but I thought that was worth playing um, uh, that concludes my little collection of the devastation uh, and war from the 1800s Nowadays, in almost everything, mankind changes, discards old things, and goes on to new things. We no longer wear the wigs and swords of our great-grandfathers. We no longer travel in stage coaches, or on muleback, or horseback. We do not live in houses now, without bathrooms. And where the only lighting is uh, the light of a candle. Well, in all those things, we change and we progress. So that's just a little taste of uh, Wells laying out a uh, timeline for us. Um, I'll link that entire interview in the description. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of uh, what I what I call hidden history. A lot of this stuff has been sort of buried and uh, put into the waste bin of history. Um, but first, uh, we'll get into the uh, the first page or two of uh, The War in the Air by Wells. Um, this one struck me. Uh, again, he's laying out a timeline he mentions here. Uh, the observation of one of the characters in the book. Um, starting with the Crystal Palace which we've talked about as the beginning of the uh, new timeline. Uh, and then he sort of goes into, let's see here, and then, then came the railway, and then the villas, then the gas works and the water works, and then the ugly sea of workmen houses and the drainage. Um, so he's basically laying out a timeline through the fiction in the novel. Um, let's see, also gets into the glass shops. It's like an explanation. It's almost like he knew um, somewhere down the road people would be digging into this, so they had to provide a um, historical timeline of, uh, of how these things came to be. The tram cars, first pulled by a horse, then by uh, electricity, and when electricity, and he also mentions the Carnegie Library. I, I find it amusing because it's, really, it's exactly what we're poking holes in now. It's interesting. Um, we'll get into the Zeppelin narrative a little bit. Uh, and then the correlations with uh, World War I, um, transitioning basically, and it basically he depicts this in, in the, um, the War in the Air as well, the transitioning of the uh, dirigibles or airships and, uh, and moving into uh, what we know as air, airplanes. But these were widespread um, and it has been all but covered up really. And we know the, uh, the Zeppelin disaster um, was like a marker in history um, to signify the death of this uh, mode of transportation. But if you've done any research into this, you'll know that uh, a lot of these were, a lot of the buildings um, were docking stations or were used as docking stations for these airships. I think there's a lot more going on here, and I think they're a larger part of our history than we know. So I'll include them in this video. This is from World War II. The U.S. Navy still using balloons. Here's a Seattle docking um, station for these airships. So we talk about the war of the uh, worlds, or the war for the world. Um, I propose we're looking at uh, 
remnants of technology of a past civilization and that the new civilization is um, starting to use but uh, also eliminating as we move into uh, the modern age. Here we have an ironclad from the Civil War. We have the steamships and ironclads. Very interesting narrative. This one also sort of um, covered up. Hard to believe 1860s these were in existence. Looking very uh, out of place according to our historical timeline. I'm giving you an idea of all the different types of airships that existed. And of course you have all these what we call water towers, monuments in a lot of the uh, towns. But we have sort of an un understood explanation, I think, of what they may have actually been. In much of the beginning of World War One, reading like uh, excerpts from the war in the air. It is interesting how he comes out of the gates. Uh, we have a bit of a steampunk depiction. Is steampunk sort of us re recollecting something that once existed? He comes out of the gates with his novels, with uh, the time machine. Um, so basically, what two uh, different races, the Morlocks, actually live underground, and they take the Eloys and they use them as food. Like, what is he really talking about there? And then he gets into um, the island of Doctor Moreau. Uh, then the War of the Worlds, which basically that was broadcast by Orson Welles later on, and really shocked the population. Um, people thinking it was an actual invasion, Mars invasion. So I think much more than meets the eye with this character. Uh, and like you've seen in this video, I have proposed that uh, what his role in all this is to fictionalize what may have occurred um, before before his time, really, uh, and to, to paint it, and Hollywood still does this, they did this masterfully, they have fictionalized anything that has a seed of truth in it, and then it can be used to cast doubt on whether or not that seed of truth exists. So, um, are we looking at previous civilization? that employ technology that we are no longer familiar with. That's very possible. Let's finish on here. On this, countless people will hate the New World Order and will die protesting against it, but we have to bear in mind the distress of a generation or so of malcontents. Well, here we are, folks, modern day. Are you malcontent? Are you willing to go along to get along? I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that it made sense. I really wanted to uh, dig a little deeper into this character. So thank you for joining me.